The Clippers, after beating the Mavericks 126-111 in a hard-fought 7-game series, have solidified their spot in the second round against the Utah Jazz. The Jazz, after a long wait since beating the Grizzlies in 5 games, now have been ready to face off against the Clippers. Today, I am going to be previewing this series and everything you need to know about it. Leave a like on this video and subscribe if you haven't already. I recap most of the playoff games in 3-5 to five minutes each and preview each and every series. If that is something which interests you, do subscribe to my channel. Moving on to the video. The Clippers managed to win the series after going down 2-0 at home. This took them much longer than it should have and they were on the brink of elimination in game 6 but a majestical performance from Kawhi won them the game. Kawhi is reminding us all why people used to consider him as the best player in the world at a point. He's without a doubt a top 5 player in the league and arguably the best player left in the Western Conference right now. He's a dominant player on both the sides of the floor and his defense is usually the X factor in games. When he decides to take over a game, he's unstoppable on both ends and this alone gives the Clippers a great advantage in any series. He averaged 32 points, 8 rebounds and 5 assists per game in this series. He has turned it up a notch in this playoffs and all his regular season load management has been justified. He shot 59% from 3 to 10 feet, 56% from 10 to 16 feet and an absurd 70% beyond 16 feet from the basket. His 3 point shooting has been just as sensational, shooting 43% on nearly 6 attempts per game. He's been much more aggressive in the playoffs, getting into the paint much more and drawing fouls more. I didn't mention that his defense has been dominant whenever he turns it out. But he didn't start the series like that. Luka Doncic was doing whatever he wanted against him in the start. He probably did not want to go all out from the start of the playoffs and was preserving energy but that does concern me. About how long he'll be able to stay dominant on defense while maintaining his high level on offense is questionable. He might have to guard Donovan Mitchell more as the series progresses and I hope he can play high level defense on him. Moving on to his partner in the wing position, Paul George. Paul George for sure hasn't been as bad as he was in the last playoffs. One thing I have to give PG credit for is that he has been much smarter this playoffs. He isn't able to hit his 3 point shot nearly as well as he did in the regular season. Last year when it was a similar case, he still stuck to his 3 point shot. He kept missing the shot and that massively hurt the Clippers. But this time when he started off the series shooting below par, he has driven to the lane much more. He's been drawing many more fouls. Even when he isn't able to hit his mid ranges, he's getting into the lane and making his shots at the rim. But the problem arises that they're going against Rudy Gobert. If PG can't hit his shots and is forced to drive into the lane to hit shots, there's going to be a tall tower waiting for him to block his shot more often than not. The difference between driving against Porzingis in the paint and Gobert in the paint is two completely different things. If he can't hit his shots, it will be a massive problem for the Clippers. Kawhi can't be forced to handle the entire offensive load and PG will have to do a much better job on defense. He can't shoot only 30% from 3. It's just not acceptable. Now comes the biggest problem according to me for the Clippers, the backcourt. They started off playing Patrick Beverly and Reggie Jackson in the series. That did not end up well. Rajan Rondo also hasn't been playing big minutes. They aren't able to use Rondo very well because both their stars are at their best when the ball is in their hands. Rondo also makes plays for other players but isn't a great shooter. He isn't a threat off the ball and this allows the defenders to focus more on the stars. Reggie Jackson is their biggest swing player. He's the only player who's been confidently shooting the ball according to me. But he isn't very consistent with it. He shoots 7 of 16 for a game and goes for 8 to 15 the next game. He isn't a very efficient player and he takes a lot of shots for someone who really shouldn't take that many. They rely a little too much on a player who is very on and off and that is concerning. Luke Kennard and Terence Mann are other players who started playing more as the series progressed. Mann provides them much required defense and energy. Offensively, he's been alright. He had a big game 7 which really helped them. Luke Kennard also had 11 points in game 7. He's the only player off the bench who can provide them much required scoring according to me. And then comes the problem, he's also inconsistent. I think this is the biggest problem of the Clippers. They rely too much on players who are very inconsistent to give them big games. The Jazz are a much better defensive team compared to the Mavericks and getting big games from the other players is very hard. Relying on such players is a recipe for disaster. Another problem for them will be the big man rotation. Zuba gets exploited in isolation situations in offense. Mitchell and Conley are good enough isolation players to take advantage of this. Ibaka has been injured and 
and hasn't been able to play much. They need a big man to match up against Gobert. They have nothing they can throw on the Gonley Gobert pick and roll. Markeith Morris will get killed if he continues playing at the center position. The only way they can stop Gobert is by forcing Gobert out of the court. They need to outplay Gobert by taking advantage of his drop coverage and offense. This is the only way they can control Gobert with their terrible big man rotation as of now. Moving on to the Jazz side of things. The Jazz went through the Grizzlies winning the series 4-1. They lost game 1 but Mitchell had not played due to this injury. All the games were much closer than they should have been and slightly concerns me. They blew multiple leads to a young Grizzlies team and let them get back into the game. But a positive they got from the series is their clutch game. They won multiple games stomping over the Grizzlies in the clutch. They showed dominance and Donovan Mitchell did an exceptional job taking over. I expected the Grizzlies to win two games mainly due to Donovan's injury and I thought that he'd be rusty. But I was proven wrong. Mitchell was quite efficient but he took and made those tough threes which he always does. And that gives me enough confidence that he is back. He averaged 29 points per game on just about average efficiency. He will be guarded by Paul George and it will be interesting to see how good of a job he can do against an elite defender like Paul George or sometimes even Kawhi Leonard. Mike Conley also had a mild hamstring strain in the Grizzlies series and this is something that lasts. Mitchell will have to be the primary initiator. His playmaking has improved this season. He passed out a double teams very well in the Grizzlies series and him and Gobert have been able to be great on the pick and roll. But he's nowhere near Conley yet as a playmaker and it will be interesting how he handles this duty if it presents itself. Conley as mentioned seemed to be injured but it looked more like they wanted to rest him for his series. He has been revolutionary for the Jazz this year. Mike Conley last year was disappointing to say the least. He looked like he had one of the worst contracts in the league and did not fit in the team whatsoever. The transition from Gasol to Gobert setting the pick wasn't easy at all for him. But this season, Conley and Gobert's pick and roll is one of the predominant reasons why they're so much better. When Gobert rolls off the screen, it collapses the defense. They have to decide if they want to guard Gobert who is one of the best pick and roll finishers in the league or Conley who has one of the best floaters in the league. And if a player comes for help, Conley is such an amazing playmaker who finds the open man for 3 and Gobert has improved so much as a passer, he finds the open man quite often too. Conley also had a great series offensively against the Grizzlies putting up 17 and 9 alongside having that 3 point game where he shot 6 threes where he shattered the Grizzlies run. Gobert did slightly struggle defensively. He was very dominant but he gave Jack too much drop coverage allowing him to hit the floater he loves. Luckily, the Clippers don't have a dominant pick and roll guard but both Paul George and Kawhi Leonard are capable drivers who should be attacking the paint a lot. The best thing about this Jazz team is that they have so many offensive options. Bogdanovich is an underrated shot creator and maker who they missed last year. He's probably going to be guarding a spot up shooter in Markeith Morris and his slow feet really won't be taken advantage of. Both Joe Ingles and Clarkson are very capable shooters and great ball handlers. Both of them are two of the three best bench players in the league and that's a blessing to have on any team. Ingles is a do it all guy who can hit a spot up 3 at a very high percentage, a good defender and an underrated playmaker. Jordan Clarkson is a heat check guy who's coming into the series after some good games at the end of the Jazz series. He might be guarded by Paul George so it'll be interesting to see how that ends up. Royce O'Neal and Derek Favors are both exceptional defenders. Royce O'Neal is the best perimeter defender who will probably be given the Kawhi matchup. He'll have his work cut out for him as he might even have to guard Paul George if Paul George is hot. This is a very good 9-man rotation which any team would love to have. Luckily as mentioned before, the Clippers don't have any guards who can take advantage of Rudy Gobert's drop coverage. They can use Serge Ibaka who will force Gobert to come out of the paint due to his stretchability but Serge seems to be injured. This is one out of the three concerns which Jazz have solved which I had in the start of the season. But the other two really haven't been solved yet. Mitchell is an exceptional scorer and I'm not denying that. He's been great in the clutch against the Grizzlies but throughout the regular season, the games in which they didn't blow the opponent out of the water and it was a close game, they didn't pull out many of these victories. As great as Mitchell is, I still believe their best shot in the clutch is to rotate the ball and get the best shot instead of feeding it for their best player for an isolation. That too when Kawhi will probably guard him in the clutch. It will be interesting how Quinn Snyder plays these close games out. Another concern which I had about them is their high 3 point level shooting. I think I can say they live and die by the 3. The games in which they can't hit 3s like game 1 against the Grizzlies, they more often than not lose. 
this is rare but in playoff basketball it can be exploited they haven't shown me anything which can make me trust that if the threes aren't falling they have a backup plan but with that being said i still have the jazz winning it in 6 or the clippers in 7 if this series does go to game 7 i trust kawai enough to pull the game out single handedly for the clippers but i can see the jazz getting real hot and rotating the ball and blowing the clippers out without even giving them a chance to take it to game 7 They are the better team and know who to play when. They might not have the best player or arguably even the second best player in the series. But the next seven players are Jazz players according to me. They are a more complete team which makes me pick them in seven games. Leave a like on this video and subscribe to my channel. I recap most of the playoff games in three to five minutes each and preview almost all the playoff series. If that is something that does interest you, do subscribe to my channel.